Okay, I do have a microphone. Awesome. Can everybody hear me okay? Good, awesome. I like the thumbs up. Okay, doke. So, if you don't know the drill, if you look for the CS199 EMP, what do you want to see? September 13th uh, under the fall 2018 announcements. There's a little link over here to the Google slide. So if you follow that, it should take you to something that looks like this. Okay, more like this. So if you guys are ready, then we can go ahead and get started. That should say two, but that's okay. So here are your weekly links for giving feedback. So um, like before, there is an anonymous feedback form just for EMP. If you click on the here, there's a nice little link for you. So this is any comments, suggestions, compliments to CAs, et cetera, that you might want to do that are EMP specific. And then there's a topic suggestion form, which is also anonymous. So if there are any topics that you would like covered, and this is different than my um, what do you want to see this week in EMP announcement, uh, you can follow the link over there. Or you're welcome to give song suggestions. I like those as well. And then, so just for a bit of clarification, um, these are not the surveys, which I will expect participation on. Um, the, the two feedback forms that are here, they're 100% optional. You can use as many times as you want. Whenever you want, they're always going to be open. Um, the first survey won't be for at least two more weeks, if not three. And then I'll give you about, like, probably two weeks to just fill out the survey. And it should take you about five minutes. You can probably do it while I'm talking. So that's coming in the future. So these are... Completely separate. Questions there? Okie doke. So what's been going on since last week? So even more array type stuff. And then we've also seen functions and strings. And you have MP1 out. So that's what I'll be covering for the next however long. So I have the slides over here. They were posted last week, so uh, hopefully you guys know what to do. If not, if you feel like following along and IntelliJ and practicing for yourself, I had the instructions here for main and taking user input. So you could hopefully follow those along. If there are any questions, feel free to grab a CA. Questions there? Okay, so lecture review. So loops, more fun and weird things you can do. So I was thinking about it. If you were here last week, um, is that big enough for you guys? For you guys to see? Can you guys see that? Okay. Yeah. Cool. Okay. So I thought it would be a little fun to do for loops in just kind of weird ways because last week we were kind of talking about like how you could have characters in there. So I was just thinking of some fun, weird things that you could do. So you could actually do for loops with strings. If you felt like it. So here, I'll do... This one first. So, this is pretty pointless. It's going to go on forever. So, this brings me to a good point. If you ever find yourself in an infinite while loop when you're testing something, there's a red stop button up here. I don't know about you, but the first time I was doing Java and I got in an infinite while loop, I freaked out and just like quickly closed in, like shut my laptop and called it done for the day programming. But you don't have to. There's just a nice little stop button right up in the corner. So you don't have to worry about that. And then similarly, we have... We 
we can escape because this time we actually set y to what it needs to be. And as you guys have probably noticed, um, for for loops, these are optional. So if we don't supply it a progression, then y is just going to be whatever value it was whenever it got done executing the for loop. And then if you actually try to do stuff with um, numbers in the string, so this isn't going to work because this is not defined for strings, so we actually have to use ints. So, and then the same issue would come up over here. And then, We have a couple different things with Booleans. So if you felt like doing stuff with Booleans. Stop. So this is going to print forever because as long as it's not B, this is always going to be true. And especially since B is equal to B, this prints forever. And then this is the opposite of that. And then since we uh, switch B to not B, we escape out. So here, I'll show you this one real quick. So this will print once. And then if you really wanted to, you could also do stuff with arrays. And then so I don't know why you would do this one, but you could. Again, infinite loop. And then if you felt like doing stuff with doubles, you could also do that as well. But, oops. Helps if you comment out the thing that's going to run forever. So this will take a while, but it'll eventually stop once we get to 9.99. There we go. So yeah, you can have some fun with different types, throwing them in loops and stuff, but for the most part, you're going to be using ints and sometimes chars as well. They'll come in handy, but I thought it would be fun to see some of the ridiculous things that you could do with loops. So be sure to have some fun while programming. Programming's fun. Any questions there? Besides, what was the point of me doing that besides to show you weird things you could do? Cool. So continuing on, I'm going to go over arrays a little bit again and then have some examples for you because I don't know about you, but for me, the first time I saw them, I thought they were kind of weird and the concept was weird and everything was about, about it was weird. So hopefully they're trying to starting to settle in a bit better. So. If this analogy helps you, I like to think of it as a really lame dresser. So it holds a bunch of the same type data. So in this case, it would be like a dresser just for socks. So we can have like a pair of socks here, 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 and here. So it has a fixed length. So you can't actually change it as soon as you declare it. It's stuck like that. And then you use the index to um, actually access the data inside. So from zero to length minus one, you can actually get whatever's inside. And then a lot of the times on why you might see that your program is breaking, um, it's oftentimes because one way or another, you're trying to access something at array um, at index length, which would be off the edge of the array. So that would be something that you guys would want to look for when you're debugging. So there are a bunch of different ways that you could write it. You can do it all on one line where you're saying that it's an int array is new int of whatever size. 
you can declare it and then initialize it, or you can actually supply all the values that you know it's going to be, and uh, Java will do the memory management math for you and figure out how much space it needs to allocate. So we can get values from the array. So assigning int some value to whatever's at array at index one, so 23 would be in here, so some value would be 23. And then setting value, we can have some value up here is equal to seven, and then array at one would be equal to some value at the end. Cool there? All right, sorry, this is going to be the most overwhelming slide with text I have. But um, one well, of you guys actually brought up a really good point about setting arrays to other arrays. So this will start to make more sense um, when we go over objects and what all is actually happening. So the way that I would like to think of it is Java is kind of a cheap language. It doesn't like to um, just hand out memory willy-nilly. So uh, if you remember the new keyword, new tells Java, OK, give me some of your memory for something new. So that's why we specify the array size. So that's how much memory, since it's the same type of data. So um, if you would have four ints or you want an array that could store four ints, Java will do that uh, memory management and give you four ints worth of space. And then, so what's actually happening is if you were to set an array to another array, it's just pointing, the two arrays are actually referring to the same container of elements. So uh, just for reference, you won't have to worry about this now, but hash code um, returns distinct integers for distinct objects. So it's like a way of identifying the object. So if we look over here at int my, my r is equal to new int of size five, and just directly assign my r2 to my r. These are actually going to end up having the same hash code because they're referring to the same distinct object. Even though we have two variables, they're referring to the same container. Meanwhile, with uh, my r3, this will be different because we actually said it was a new array. So just to prove it to you guys, Same code as before, so my r and my r2 actually have the same hash code, while my r3 is going to have a different one since it's an actual new array. So that's actually what's going on over there. Hopefully that, if it doesn't completely make sense, hopefully you guys could at least like sit with it and be like, okay, I guess. But any questions there? Yeah. Yeah, so um, they're referring to the exact same object. So anything that you do with myr2 is going to directly affect if you were to go back and use myr1. The same change will be reflected regardless. So suppose I just change everything that is in myr2 and myr1 also changes. Yeah, so you'll see a lot of things change and be different. So this will start to make a little bit more sense once you, we get to the object part of Java being an object-oriented language. But yeah, you're exactly right. Any other questions? Yeah? My R2 equal to my R3? I forget if they do this same as strings where it's a reference level here. A 
Okay, so it would be false because um, the way that it's defined is it will um, go to the same like hash code or if they're referring to the same set of objects. So that's also why um, with strings, we have to do the dot equals because it's not actually going to be looking at if the string, if we have the word cat and we have two strings that say the word cat, those are actually going to be different strings if we declare them um, at different times. But if we were to set them to equal to one another and they refer to the same object, uh, the double equals uh, refers to um, if they're referring to the same object. Good question. Yeah? Um, you, you don't really have to worry about what hash code means uh, for now, but a way you can think of it is how Java can uniquely identify distinct objects. So it's just a way of Java figuring out, okay, you're referring to this object or this object. So this will come in handy once we have to like sort and uh, use what's called hash maps, but we won't have to worry about that until later. It's just a way of uniquely identifying stuff. Is that a, an okay enough answer for you? All right. Any other questions? All right, cool. So a little bit of a picture representation, if I can make this go away. Yeah, so MyR and MyR2 would be referring to the same dresser, while MyR3, we just made a new dresser. So that's a long story short uh, picture representation of kind of what's going on. All right, so arrays and loops. Um, I have a couple examples here, but First off, I know that the enhanced for loop um, is kind of weird, and a lot of people might think it's really cool, but sometimes it doesn't always come in the best handy. And the way that I actually see it is like I look at the semicolon as an I, so for each element in the array. So we can go ahead and. And then we'll also get a little bit of practice in here with um, seeing break and continue. So arrays and loops, we've kind of noticed that they go hand in hand. And now we might actually be able to see some of the situations um, where we would actually be using break and continue in terms of loops. So, over here, and it'll probably be a good idea for you guys to um, get used to the modulo operator because I'll help you with your MP. So if RI mod two is equal to one, so if you divide um, whatever value is at R of I by two and you get a remainder of one, this is going to pr print out continue and then continue. So, go ahead and uncomment this. So, yeah, we can see that um, for one, three, five, seven, it's actually going to print out continue. And we see that below, since it's going to hit the continue every time that uh, there's an odd number in the array that it's going to jump back to the iterator since it's a for loop. And this won't actually ever get printed if it's an odd number because it already continued before it reached that line. So we'll only see it for even numbers. Yeah? Um, just to um, show what's actually happening with the continue. So... Uh, whenever it actually does hit the continue, it just moves on to the next thing. Okay. So this is just uh, for you to visualize what's going on with continue. So there's not like a solid purpose in this example. It's just 
more visualizing. Any other questions? All right, so similarly, we have while continue and spoilers, there's going to be something about this where it's going to make it go on forever. So go ahead and comment this out. So continue, 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 forever and ever. So do you guys see why this is continuing forever? Yeah, exactly. So since we actually started out with an odd number and we entered this if statement and it went to continue, oh, this is the four. Here we go. So since we actually um, started out with an odd number and we went into the if statement with the continue, and while loops, they go to the condition. There's no way for the while loop to know where exactly if we have, even if we have a progression anywhere where it is. So it just jumps back to the top. So i is never incrementing, so we're stuck at this first element. So we'll continue, continue, continue until you end up hitting the red stop button. So, yeah. I don't have a witty comment for that. So, questions? All right. So, a little bit different one now. Um, what's going on over here is we'll find lucky number seven and just return the index. And then if we don't find it, just return negative one. So if we see over here, So actually, what's going on over here is that if we don't find it, just return negative one. So we got a little excited with the break. We found our i is equal to seven. So we're like, cool, we're done searching. We found lucky number seven. And then over here is just printing out where we're at. But we never said anywhere that it, we were going to return this value. So a good, so we would actually have to throw in something over here. So the way that it, I would at least fix this is create something called the index that we would return and go ahead and set it to negative one. And then if we found it, we could go ahead and set it to I and then break. Here, we'll actually do this. So index is three, go back up, zero, one, two, three, there's seven. So now we're good. And then similar, similar, Similarly, we have the while break. And if we just wanted to directly return i as soon as we found it, instead of breaking out and returning it at the end, we could go ahead and do this as well. So questions there? Yeah. So it does exactly what it says. So it's actually going to return. So since we have the for loop and we have i declared over here, it's going to return the index or i of wherever we found the seven. 
So in the one below, we can see that the index was three because we were returning the index where we found seven. So as soon as we hit it, then we actually know that we're done with the function because the purpose of the function was to find wherever the index of seven was. So as soon as we find it, we can just get out of the function and return back to main. So you'll kind of learn some of these, like, I guess they, they would be tricks on, like, how you can, like, get done with your function a little bit quicker. But like we saw before, if we just wanted to go ahead and break and then return it at the end, because that's kind of what we're used to, that's perfectly acceptable. Uh, if we were to return it in here, that's cool too. Um, basically, it would be whatever um, you're most comfortable with at this point because efficiency, especially at this scale, is not going to matter. But just different ways of you being able to write stuff. Any other questions? Cool. Question slide. Can you take yours? All right. So algorithms. We went over them, I think, last week r real briefly. So the way that you can think of it is um, a process or a set of rules to be followed in calculations or other problem-solving operations, especially, or in our case, like always by a computer. So how we basically ask ourselves, how do we solve a problem? And we want to describe in high level steps how to solve that problem. So for you guys, you might use the Feynman problem solving algorithm. So you write down the problem, you think very hard, and then you write down the solution. And that's all you need for solving all your problems in your life three-step algorithm. So questions on algorithms? So chances are when, whenever you're thinking of your algorithm, you're going to implement it in a function. So functions um, are units of instruction that perform a specific task. And you want to make it good. So good meaning that it has Typically, one purpose is testable and is reusable. So in my little function example over here, we have a function that adds up all the elements in an array, but also prints hello world. It launches a rocket with a pepperoni pizza to Pluto, and it detects Jeff can't wait for CS125 in five minutes. This, while it would be super cool, is a terrible function. So if in this case, if I just wanted to add up a bunch of numbers, I didn't want anything else to happen. And now I'm going to have to figure out how to fund all these rockets being launched during testing, which I assume is very expensive. And then you couldn't actually use this unless it was five minutes before class. Otherwise, Jeff would get annoyed. So the important part of, especially when it comes to your MPs, is seeing how far down you could break a function into. Because the more modular or the more broken down that your function is, the better off that you're going to be. Questions on the high level function stuff? All right, so as you may have noticed from your MP or just learned before, so functions can have parameters. So these will be values supplied by the caller to be used. So they're already given to us. And chances are they're given to us for a reason. So we're actually supposed to be doing something with them. And then the return type. So as we saw with the return before, we're typically returning some sort of result of the hard work that we just did. So unless it's void, then you could just return. You could actually type the word return in a void function if you felt like it. If not, as soon as it gets to the bottom of a function, it's implied to return. So that's why 
if you've seen some of the void functions and you didn't see a return in there, it's implied at the bottom. And then, so they're typically at the end, but as we saw from the example before, we can actually put the return statement anywhere. So as soon as we actually reach it, the method is done. So we return from the method. So in the example with the array um, index for seven, as soon as we found seven somewhere in the array, we were done. So we could return from the method. Cool. Yeah. Um, if you were to have a bunch of values in an array or something like that, but at least with Java, you can only return one thing. So you would have like one int or one array or whatever. As soon as it finds something to return, it's going to return it. Cool. Good question. So with parameters, so they're already given to us. And as you guys may have noticed, um, final means that the variable can't be modified. So I made a cute little comment. But basically, this means that um, we can use the variable however we want. But as soon as we try to do something where it modifies the value of it, then we're going to get yelled at by Java. So this is cool. We're just using n. This is fine. We can make another variable and assign it to the value of n, and then go ahead and change that variable's value and return that, that's cool. But this isn't okay. So over here, if I have a four, this is cool. This is actually gonna give you an unreachable statement because as soon as it hits a return, it's not gonna execute anything more, so. This is fine. This one's cool. But if we wanted to do something like this, we'll see the red squiggly line of death of can I assign a value to a final variable n. So basically that's what's going on. Questions there? All right, and then return types. So again, it's the result of the hard work that we just did. So um, unless it's void, then it just returns. It doesn't have a value that you can grab onto and use within other parts of your program. And again, we can use um, return statements in for loops, kind of like break statements, where as soon as we find the value that we want to return, we can go ahead and get out. Um, if not, then we can just continue on. So it's one of the many different ways you could write a for loop if you were searching for a particular value or as soon as you find the result that you want, you can return or break. Or keep going. You can go through the entire loop as well. But good on functions? All right, so strings. We can finally write things. Well, we could before, but now we actually have variables that can store text. And uh, you've probably seen them before we actually formally address what they were. So these are actually technically an object. So as we saw before, objects combine state and behavior. So state, you uh, a way to determine if something has to do with state. You can say like it is or it stores. So a string, it is an array of characters. And then behaviors, it does, so functions that operate on its state. So however um, we want to use the string, so we can convert it to a char array, or we can make everything all um, uppercase or lowercase, so whatever we want to do. So strings will do it, and that would be its behavior. So string, double quotes, 
versus character, the single quotes and all the characters are individual meme on string, we can have things as long or as short as we want as long as it's within the memory limits. So we've seen some of the dot notation. So we could do stuff like get the length or get char at whichever um, index if we're looking at it like a char right now or to uppercase. So the cool thing about IntelliJ actually is as soon as you do the my string dot, IntelliJ is actually going to pop up a bunch of the different methods that are defined for string. So if you don't always remember the exact method name, you can kind of scroll down. And most of them are um, at least fairly self-explanatory, like to uppercase or char at or length. So I went ahead and linked the docs on strings. So yeah. Any questions on strings? All right, so I'm going to do a quick MP walkthrough. And mostly, I just want to highlight um, this important part. So there's 10 points for submitting your code. That earns at least 20 points before tomorrow at 5 PM. So that means that you need to be committing something that gets at least 20 points in order to get those 10 points. And in, you can actually do this like before you leave today and get your points. So you can see from print lines, you get 10 points for submitting code that compiles for print lines. And then you get 10 points for submitting code that compiles and encrypt. So as soon as you, like your code completely just compiles and you can run it, you've got your points. So. It doesn't even have to be close to accurate or anything for the string. If it returns a string, you could just put return, give me my points, and you'll be good to go. So looking at it a little bit more in detail, not So encrypt, we have scanner, uh, minimum shift and max shift. These are going to come in handy if somebody is trying to shift too much or too little. We have encrypt over here, the line to encrypt and how much to shift it by. And then we have a bad return statement, so you might want to fix those. Oh, what just happened? And then we also have similar for decrypt. So decrypting a single line of text, so the line and the shift. And then if you want to test stuff out yourself, there's the main function where you can actually run it instead of running all the tests. Print lines. So we have the line printer and then whatever actress that we're supposed to print for. And then the script lines that we're going to go through. And again, if you can fix this to what it's supposed to return. So if it's void. That's a little hint on whether or not it should be returning anything. Then we're good to go there. And then we also have the main function where you can run stuff yourself. Um, that was just the like quick and dirty overview of MP1. Are there any high level questions there? Any questions overall? Um, yeah, I reserve the right to not answer it, but. Right. So this is the little hint that I had with like the modulo operator. So you know how the modulo always gets the remainder. So if you're dividing something by whatever, eh, you're always going to get a remainder between 0 and um, whatever you're modulating by minus 1. Because 
if you were modding by 128, you would never have a remainder of 128. It could only be 127. So that's a little hint that you might want to think about how you can use the operator there. Yeah. Any other questions? All right. Oh, yeah. Um, the shift is negative um, as long as it's greater than the min shift. You should account for that. Yeah. Okay, yeah. So you're actually going to see um, whenever you have the sources tab open, and then you can um, open up the main one, and then there's this resources. So what's actually going on over here is um, these are the two um, scripts that um, you can actually look at as like a resource or an example of what it's actually going to look like. So we can see over here that it has this guy Mark and a bunch of texts for him. And then this other guy, Roger, is going to be talking. So this is how you'll actually um, look through. And I believe it specifies that. Um, so on a line capitalized. So. Um, it's going to appear alone capitalized. So you can see that over here, that's alone and capitalized. So those would be uh, the strings that you would be looking for in the entire text. And then um, you would, it stops speaking, uh, the character stops speaking once you reach an empty line. So we can see right here that there's a line space between Mark and Roger. So as long as you could get that text between there, however you want to do it that's what you're going to be doing. And then as long as you follow the other requirements, like groups of lines are separated by the dash. So you'll want to print these dividers as well. And then if an actress doesn't exist, you should print nothing. So that's, that's a way for you um, to be continuously testing your code because if you code it in such a way where it's going to print their name every time that it searches for it, or if you have, if you automatically print like a dash, dash, dash line at the beginning, you're going to have to rethink how to do your code just in case you're given like an actress that doesn't actually exist. So how would you account for that? Any more questions? These are good questions. All right, so I'm actually going to do things a little bit differently this time. So what I want to do is if you guys want to take this time um, to work on MP1, that's totally cool. Um, you have complete access to the CAs that we have, and they're absolutely awesome, so they'll be able to help you out. But what I'm actually going to do is um, if people have, like, any actual content questions or want more practice with the actual content, I'm going to reserve myself for that. So if people were more interested in getting more help over there, they could come up and we can work problems and do everything else content related. But if you guys don't have any content questions, then I'll just like jump in with everybody else and help out. But I'm going to hang out over here for a bit. And I have a couple um, example practice problems or I'm more than happy to like come up with um, different examples that might help you. So does that make sense? All right, cool. Well, I'll leave the rest of the time up to you to decide how, it, um, how to do it. And yeah, so have fun. Go Java. <laughs>